60 Minutes Overtime. This week on 60 Minutes, our story is about Sir David Attenborough, who's just a remarkable man. I've watched him all my life. You have had a huge influence on my life, and watching you in Rwanda in 1978 was really transformational for me. I thank you for that. Thank you. In England, they refer to him as a national treasure. In his advancing years, he's become known as the elder statesman of the planet. But 20 years later, my name is Michael Gafshon, and I'm the producer of the story we're doing this week on Sir David Attenborough. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, do you want to chat? Hi, it's Anderson. How are you? <laughs> I'll ask you the questions. <laughs> what was really so surprising is that here we had a 94-year-old man who has all his marbles, as he would say, speaking to Anderson Cooper, who was across the oceans. And when we arrived, she and was basically... We were a little concerned that it would be stilted, that it wouldn't be a conversation, well, that it wouldn't feel like a 60 Minutes interview. We couldn't have been more wrong. You have one of the most distinctive, if not the most distinctive voice for narration. I mean, it's extraordinary and it's incredibly compelling and draws people in. Is it true that early on, when you, your documentaries were shown on American television, they actually had somebody else they would hire actors to, to, to do the narration? Oh, yeah, uh, certainly, yes. A act actresses, actually. There was an actress. Uh, Hollywood film stars, yes. And, and the fact was, of course, that, that it wasn't the person who was telling the story that was important in like, these films. It was, in fact, the, the animals themselves doing what they were doing. He's one of the most respected natural history filmmakers in the world. And he's often credited with really creating the genre. I mean, he's shown us things in new ways time and time again over the decades. I, I got into the business because I love the natural world. I found it absolutely fascinating. I can't think of anything I'd rather do. The living world is a unique and spectacular marvel. This new film he's made is really a stark warning about the future of the planet. And he's using his decades of experience to really sound the alarm in a way he's never done before. You did say once that I'm always cautious about crying wolf. I think conservationists have to be careful in saying things are catastrophic when, in fact, they are less than catastrophic. Yes. Well, I don't know how you define a catastrophe, of course. Yeah, I think it gives your warnings in A Life on Our Planet all the more power that you were skeptical before and cautious before about saying something is a catastrophe if you're not entirely sure. That's right. And we as broadcasters, and particularly natural history broadcasters, if we're going to say a thing is a catastrophe, we'd better jolly well be sure. So with all that you've, you've shown us over the years, do you ever ask yourself why we're here? Yes. And the answer? I don't know. In 2002, Ed Bradley did a segment about Sir David. And it was very interesting that Bradley asked him about climate change, asked him about the destruction of this planet. And he was very reluctant to talk about it. The most important job is persuading people that the natural world is complex and wonderful and one of the most precious things we have. And if you're going to do that, then every time you do it, you show the facts, you end up by saying, and it's all disappearing and it's all your fault, people will stop viewing. His position since has changed significantly. He really didn't want to be a doomsayer in those days. He's extremely worried about the future of our planet and He's making every effort at this time of his life to get his message out. And how, if we act now, we can yet put it right. What is it that still drives you? I mean, at 94, you would be certainly earn the right to study rocks and, and stay at home with your family. I do, do quite a lot of that. But um, if you can see it going on, You've had the privilege, of, I, I mean, I have been unbelievably privileged in my life to go around seeing all these miraculous, heartwarming things around the world. I have no alternative but to speak about it. In any case, that's what I was, why I went. I wanted to speak about it. I've just had a, my first child. I've had a son, and he will be six months old. What sort of a world will he inherit? It's up to the, the voters, assuming that they are talking about democratic societies where voters can have a say, um, voters can, can determine that now. And that's one of the reasons why 
I think we have some hopes, some fragments, some threads of optimism. You have hope that young people will be able to actually make change? Oh, certainly. 